updates. So six security, I believe you are up first. Who do we have? Oh. I didn't expect. I thought I'd have a little bit more time to wake myself up. Uh, now we've got to move fast here, JJ. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Uh, yeah, so uh, we have uh, 56 members now, up uh, three more from since the last time we gave an update, and now 40 plus affiliations. I stopped counting on the number of affiliations, it's too hard. Um, so, Cloud Native Security Day, uh, thanks to Michael, Lucy, uh, and Amy and Emily, uh, it's come together really nice and uh, we have 150 plus people that are registered and the talks are full and we publish the schedule out there. Um, we do want to see if we could encourage more uh, diversity by giving out more uh, diversity passes for atten attendance. So uh, Sarah and I are working on that. We'll circle back on that with any asks uh, to the TOC. Um, governance, we've uh, finalized the definition of the roles. We've put together tech lead, project lead, and assessment uh, owners for uh, some of the assessments. And uh, I'd highly appreciate if any people can go in and then chime in on uh, any of that. Uh, we're uh, almost done with the assessment for OPA, I think. Uh, we're actually presenting it later today. We are presenting it later today. Thanks, Sarah. That's going to be fun. Uh, uh, so we did learn a, learn quite a bit in that OPA assessment and any inputs and any intakes on that so that uh, uh, where we can improve the process or uh, where more clarity is required would be a super helpful uh, input from, from this group. <clears throat> uh, policy working group, uh, uh, we are folding that in. I mean, we've already folded that into the six security. Uh, there's more work going on in the policy working group. Uh, there's a proposal for formal verification that's happening there. Um, I'd uh, encourage people to go take a look at it. Uh, it's uh, sort of trying to use a single language to define uh, the security posture for the entire of the infrastructure. So it'll be useful for people that are that care about distributed systems, which I would think most of them here are, uh, to take a look at that and chime in and help. Uh, we do have uh, assessment priorities uh, that we've published. Uh, uh, we, uh, we sort of agreed on the criteria and condition uh, with uh, Joe yesterday, Liz, and uh, I think if there is anything that needs to be changed on uh, how we think through in terms of what the criteria is for picking up of assessment, we'd be open to, but right now we have uh, uh, sort of finalized on that, and then we've put together the list of things that we are gonna be assessing there. Um, the second ask is also um, guidance on uh, who the audience for white paper is. Uh, I'm starting that process uh, with the help of TOC uh, liaison. So any input there would be super helpful. Um, you could either chime in here, uh, ping me on Slack, or uh, the best best place best possible place is six security depot, like uh, chime in on the issue. Uh, that's update from six security. Thanks. All right, who do we have from storage? Uh, Aaron and Alex are both on, uh, but I'll be going over the review. Um, so, and Quentin is on as well. Apologies, Quentin. Um, so right now we're going through uh, reviewing Dragonfly. We're looking to engage the tech leads from the storage SIG as well to help with the project review. Just making sure that we're looking at the process of scaling going forward and how to best utilize all the team members. Uh, we completed Longhorn and Chiboa FS. Longhorn we're going to talk about uh, later today on this call. So. Um, Ongoing, uh, we continue to update the landscape white paper uh, along with uh, database updates and also documenting different use cases, uh, you know, what is commonly available. And then we're looking to also put in some metrics around performance and benchmarking. Um, and then the next steps, uh, as I mentioned, is we're defining a process for reviewing these projects. Since the current Review criteria for sandbox inc incubation and graduation were based on not a non-SIG process. We recognize that um, 
we need to work with the TOC in a way that makes sense to provide recommendations for projects so that we're not doing the due diligence twice. Um, so we've started a very rough draft of this process. Uh, the link is on this slide um, and we'd, we'd love to talk about that in more detail, perhaps maybe in the private TOC call to figure out um, how we best go about that for all the SIGs, but this is our, our first run through on that. Are there any questions? All right. I think that process document looks like we need permission to access, so we might get a few requests for that. Okay, so SIG app delivery. Do we have Brian? Brian's here. Yay. Yes, so we are, we're still ramping up and trying to get up to speed, uh, but I wanted to call out a few items that we are touching right now. Uh, there is this cloud native app delivery dictionary that Harry from Alibaba started. And what it's trying to do is bring a set of, a standard set of words or maybe a consensus around a set of words that we use to describe cloud native terms in respect to the SIG apps delivery. So that document is up for review right now and probably in about a week and a half, we're going to um, start really pressing on people to get the words in so we can uh, turn it into a deliverable. Um, the next item is this uh, creating this application definition document. And really what we want to do there is we want to start thinking about what it um, abstract from an abstract point of view, what it takes to uh, describe an application and get that down into words too. Um, so there's no link because the document doesn't exist yet. Uh, it will over the next week. And the final item was that we are working out logistics for KubeCon. We're going to have two sessions and um, it's pretty helpful that, that I can actually affect that, but we're making sure that we have two interactive sessions to introduce the new group. And um, as far as notes, uh, Quentin brought up last week that uh, the second and fourth Tuesday of the month was a little contentious at 11 a.m. Eastern time for meetings. So we're going to move it to the first and the third Tuesday at the same time because I, looking at the calendar, it's a lot better. We're working with Amy to get that taken care of. And then also, uh, this is something we need help with. Um, we have a pull request to update uh, the SIG apps delivery uh, repo so that myself, Alice, and Harry can access it. And that PR has been sitting out there for a little bit, so we just need I'm someone to- on it. We will get it fixed. I already know that. I was just bringing it up. I Amy and I did talk Bye. about that before. Shame, so, shame. Um, what'd you say? Shame, we, we don't, your name's up there, come on, <laughs> <laughs> hurry up. So um, that, that's about it. Um, but what's really what's going to happen now is I think that um, Harry, Alice and I have a cadence and we can start moving on to more complex things. And something I didn't put on this list was, um, there's no way we can do this all. So um, discussion around tech leads for some of the things that we're trying to do um, will be coming up and we will definitely be discussing that next on our next um, call. So that's it for me. Thank you, Brian. And the new, the latest SIG to join the ranks, Runtime. SIG now known as Runtime. Hi, yes. Um, sorry about the very busy slide there, uh, but basically just a public service announcement. We have a draft charter. Uh, quite a few people have been through it. I think it's kind of Getting to the uh, final stage now, there's still a little bit of time left for uh, ch chiming in if you would like to. Um, we've provisionally changed the name of the SIG from core to runtime. There were some pretty valid objections to the name core. Uh, runtime was, I think, the best we could come up with, but probably still not perfect. Uh, so if anyone has any better ideas, please feel free to contribute. Uh, and if you would like to get involved further in the SIG, uh, please reach out to myself, uh, Brian or Brendan, who are the TOC liaisons for this uh, SIG. The scope is, is everything to do with, you know, execution stuff. So Kubernetes type things. So workload execution, management systems, component interfaces, 
uh, general orchestration, auto scaling. I'm not going to read through the whole slide there, uh, but also specialized architectures of these things. So, you know, for example, the container orchestration systems aim aimed at edge computing, IoT, batch, etc., uh, and incorporating you know specialized computing elements. Um, so the the projects that are kind of in that scope at the moment, pretty much as per the original TOC uh, specification of the SIGs. So Kubernetes, ContainerD, Harbor, Dragonfly, Virtual Kubelet, CRIO, CubeEdge, and the new KubeBert. That's it for me, unless anyone has any questions or comments. Thanks, Quinton. And then I like how we have other SIGs question mark, SIG network. <laughs> <laughs> ouch ouch <laughs> you gotta um, remove that question mark right <laughs> yeah no that uh i've already learned to, to be on the right side of amy this is uh, this is just a reminder oh very good so this particular sig has been well uh, i don't know embarrassingly a long time coming um it's a bit of a reincarnation of the networking working group um we had uh, it was our goal shortly after KubeCon EU in Barcelona to to reincarnate and reform kind of recharter um, with a bit of an expanded scope. Um, we're finally um, doing that now. So there's a, a draft charter that's been sent out for a broad review. There have been a number of folks who've signaled interest um, in this area. Um, and it makes a lot of sense when you consider how networking as a discipline is just part and parcel to every request that flows through a distributed, you know, uh, system through a distributed application. So, um, so uh, networking, like some of the other SIGs, uh, ends up touching um, a fair number of areas. In general, I think that we consider topics and kind of projects that fall within the cloud native network, API gateway, coordination and service discovery, service mesh service proxy, and RPC categories within the landscape are, um, you know, of foremost focus and will be topics of discussion. Um, one of those actually that falls within coordination and service discovery is etcd, um, that I think is already the focus of um, SIG storage. And so we've kind of, kind of pushed etcd from, from focus. I think that there's a lot of other uh, backlog to go through. There are uh, open standards, open specifications that are emerging um, in the space for things at proxy layers, for things at surface mesh layers. Uh, this provides a good uh, vendor neutral venue for those uh, discussions, for helping advance some of those initiatives. Initially, we're intending to hopefully be, be light on some of the governance, be um, light on some of the roles, and that's all TBD based on how many folks and participants descend upon the, the SIG, and everyone is encouraged and welcome to do so. There's a channel in the CNCF Slack, uh, a new mailing list, and what will be an intro slash deep dive session uh, at KubeCon. And so uh, please do go, if you're interested, please do go review the charter. We're hoping to respond to comments and solidify within a couple of weeks. So. Terrific, glad to see all these SIGs forming. And it uh, looks like we're gonna have a full compliment by, uh, by uh, KubeCon, I think. Um, I actually have a question just related to the sort of um, other SIGs question mark. Um, and this may be a question particularly for folks in um, SIG app delivery. Um, I'm wondering whether it might make sense for a serverless SIG to kind of form out of what is currently the serverless uh, working group. I wonder if anybody has thoughts around that whether that would make sense to be another SIG. I think we did discuss that when we were formulating the draft uh, SIG breakdowns. And at the time, uh, application development fell under SIG apps. And we thought that serverless was a kind of application development. There's also the, the issue of serverless platform. 
platforms and, and the kind of support that things like Kubernetes need to provide for, you know, fast, fast containers, etc. Um, and so, so that was the thinking at the time uh, that it fell under SIG app delivery. And are folks from SIG app delivery kind of happy to continue to cover that space? Does it feel like a natural home there? It does. Um, but like Quentin said, there's the application side and then there's the, like, if you think about like Knative with the eventing side, which is under the cover. So there are two, two ways of looking at it. Um, we can actually start looking at it from the front side and we probably, and we actually are going to, uh, but I think the other side does need some love. So your decision there. There, there, there hasn't been a lot of uh, movement in, in the serverless working group for a while since that group has moved to uh, cloud to the cloud events uh, uh, sandbox project and trying to get that wrapped up. I anticipate that we'll switch back over to doing some work on, on the serverless working group, you know, try to look at updating the document and everything. But, uh, you know, I agree that there are, are two sides to this. There's, uh, you know, kind of the more general, where is serverless going, et cetera, that the serverless working group is looking at. And then that, that app delivery, which I think belongs in, in you know, in uh, the current. So, yeah, we, we sort of, when we completed the white paper, we kind of presented that back to the TLC and um, kind of made a decision not to do anything further with serverless at that point. And so, to, you know, to the point that was just made, we, we can definitely pick it back up. We've kind of moved over to cloud events and started working on that as sort of the action we took away. And so if there's other things we want to do, the, it definitely makes sense to keep that um, in the CNCF, I believe. Hey, Liz. This is Jeff. I, yeah, I, I think we should have a, at least try to do a serverless SIG. So, um, I, I'm pretty passionate about it. Um, and uh, yeah, can we can we put that on a a, you know, potential to kind of move the the serverless working group into a serverless SIG. I personally think that would be a good thing to have as a, uh, even if at this point the, the existing working group is relatively quiet, maybe we should have a, I think right now there's a PR or an issue that has the kind of list of proposed SIGs, we could have it as a possible future SIG at the point where, it, yeah, I, I worry that there's a bunch of underlying serverless infrastructure, serverless projects yeah. that maybe don't quite fall naturally into into the app delivery world. Yeah, so yeah. so I'll, I'll, I can take that one um, and try to and talk with the server, current service working group and um, and and see if we can just see if we can do a describe a, a pull request for for that for that thing. There's another option here that we have, which is to, to keep it as a working group that is focused on serverless inside one of the SIGs. Uh, and the two you know, obvious SIGs, one would be app delivery and the other one would be what we've now called uh, uh, runtime. Um, because a lot of, you know, having been involved in some projects that are building serverless uh, layers on top of Kubernetes, for example, there's, there's quite a lot of general purpose useful stuff that needs to be added to Kubernetes to make it suitable for a serverless platform. And, uh, and I think that would, it would be useful to have those conversations in, in this, in the runtime SIG, for example, because they're not, they're not all serverless specific problems. They're actually platform general problems. Just a thought. So maybe we could just re-energize the working group and, and drive discussions in those other two SIGs. Exactly. Okay. You know, have, have the working group be the place where where serverless specific stuff is discussed, um, and and it can be homed in either of those two SIGs, whichever that working group thinks is the best home for it. All right. Why don't we? I, I think as Martin okay. suggested, let's let's have the existing serverless working group um, discuss amongst themselves for a while. Um, I I just wanted to flag that as a possible area that right now feels a little bit buried away from the. 
uh, other SIGs, but I think we should probably move on and talk about Longhorn, if that's okay. And Liz, if, if Doug is on, and I can take the action to, to get back to you guys with um, the feedback from the Solar Sword group on that. Thank you, Ken. Great. All right. So Longhorn, Shane, do you want to uh, take it from here? Yes. Thank you, Liz. So um, from last time, the uh, the presentation of Longhorn in the TOC, we get some feedback about uh, we currently don't have very strong development community driven development. So the current situation is uh, we do have uh, pretty active user communities, but we have to admit that there's are many contributions from developer outside the rancher labs. And we have identified a few reasons. Uh, the first one is we think this the tech, the long horns technology is really uh, considered high learning curve compared to some others. And in this case, we need to invest much more into providing a guidance or documents for developers. We mainly focus on providing documents and the guidance for the user at the moment. So that's one thing we need to change. And the second thing is the development process is mainly driven by our internal Rancher Labs engineers. And uh, for, for the outside, they can see uh, what issue has been working on and uh, how, when, when it's being done and when the release is going to happen. But that still doesn't, um, they, don't, they don't have the full view of the process and how to get involved. That's probably another barrier as well. And also, um, the project awareness is not really high enough. So um, that's, I, I think that's basically, uh, I, I would think that if 100 people start using your project, probably, I don't know, less than 1% probably going to contribute. So in, cre uh, in order to get higher contribution and developer, we also need to uh, increase the product's uh, uh, wellness by all means. And finally, we think as the rental labs, as the parent company may make people think Longhorn is biased towards or exclusive with rancher. And uh, say some, there are many people ask if uh, Longhorn can only be used as the rancher and can be used by, on the OpenShift and on the other uh, like AWS or GKE. The answer is in fact, Longhorn can be installed on any Kubernetes, but with the rancher's umbrella on that. So this makes me think it Longhorn is probably biased. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So um, based on what we what we observe and what we think may be the potential reasons, we have uh, formulated the following actions to uh, make sure the growth of the developers community. And the first is we are going to make a barrier, the technical barrier lower for the new contributors. And uh, we are going to invest more time and providing the architecture design doc and all kinds of uh, design docs. And the document make it easy for user to, uh, for the developer to understand how long one works and how the components interact with each other. And uh, also the currently the Longhorn's development requires three node cluster on the Kubernetes. We normally do that on some DigitalOcean cloud provider. But if you think that not everybody have a cloud provider backing them up, so we are trying, we are, we are going to make it possible to complete the development setup on a laptop. And probably going to utilize K3S or some technologies to make a standalone Kubernetes a small footprint um, setup and make it possible to complete the development there. And also with uh, some other small things like we can mark small issues and help on it to get the computer to know which issues they probably can uh, use as a gateway to get into the development in the long run. And the second thing is we want to make the development process, process more transparent. And uh, from now on, all the new features design doc will be shared. And uh, we are, uh, currently we are thinking about using the form as either Wiki or using Google Doc because the, the new development, a uh, new design doc no, normally going to be modified a lot. So probably we, we haven't 
decide to acquire the uh, to adopt uh, the Kubernetes KEP style contribute uh, KEP style design doc probably going to be too big for us for now, but uh, we can see down the road how it goes. And also, we are going to hold a monthly community meeting to discuss the latest design and update of the project. And uh, that's we have just decided the meeting we are going to be held on the second Friday, on the of each month. And uh, next week will be our first meeting. And uh, speaking about how to avail, uh, raise the awareness of the project, and uh, of course we're already trying to speak as uh, we already try to speak as uh, many community uh, events as possible, but we haven't uh, do much on the developer meetup and the small conferences, and we are going to spend more time on that and try to reveal, try to raise the awareness on that part. And finally, regarding the Rancher Labs as parent company, so that's also one of the reasons we are going to donate. We try to donate one horn to the CNCF. So with the CNCF serve as a neutral, room, a neutral home for the project, I think the concern on the bias towards uh, the Rancher will be uh, at least will be diminished. So that's is uh, what we uh, get the, the feedback we got and the, the things we are planning to do to address these feedbacks on the community side. Can I say a few things? Sure. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. Um, well done. Um, I think that we already did, Liz, confirm or not, did we already vote on Longhorn for, for a sandbox? Well, uh, it's sandbox, so it's more yes. of a, uh, <laughs> um, I, my, my recollection of this is that uh, there were some concerns raised about whether or not Longhorn had a sufficient, you know, community or plan to engage with community. I absolutely echo what you're saying. I think this is great that, to see this conscious effort going into making this work. So I think the concern that was raised was about whether Longhorn had a, um, a, you know, that kind of breadth of community or had a plan to achieve that breadth of community. Um, I trying to remember who, I think yourself, me and Shang might have been, sorry, Shang might have been the uh, people interested in sponsoring. Yeah. Just, um, hi, it's Alex over here. So, so it's probably worth just noting that the SIG had reviewed the Longhorn project and we had sort of given it the thumbs up and yep. send, send the information to the TOC. And I, and I believe last time round, um, when we got to this point, uh, it wasn't so much about the, the community, but there were sort of a couple of question marks around um, things like the CLA, which were which were things that we kind of all agreed were 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 things that can be sort of sorted out post adoption as a sandbox project. Um, so, honestly, I I think it's just a case of you know if 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 there are two top members that are ready to sponsor it, then it should be a sandbox project at this stage. Right. So I would like to apologize to the Longhorn team because we put them through a lot. Um, and you've done really great and you've been incredibly patient and I think everybody now thinks that your project is more than worthy of the the bar that is sandbox uh, would, would anyone like to dissent with that statement I completely agree with that statement fantastic well then Liz um, unless you disagree I'd like I propose that we move forward and long from become a sandbox project and thank you very much for to Shang and team for, for doing this and I think it's a good template for other projects that have come through this process where they've been shepherded very much as a sort of single vendor thing and like are trying to open up in stages slowly little by little as they come into the foundation. Um, I, sorry. Either of you, I, I think it does point to the improved process that we were trying to work on. I'm trying to open up the docs. I got to move it to my Gmail account, but um, where we don't require for people like this to, to present twice, then I think we want to reduce the work, especially for sandbox. So please uh, contribute to that doc so we can harden the process. Amy, I wonder if we could um, essentially reuse some of this plan 
here as a kind of template um, or, or have it somewhere as a reference because yeah. I think that there's some great material that. here. Yeah, some great ideas. Yeah, we can work on that. So I think that means that we should now consider Longhorn a sandbox project. All right, thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you for your patience, Shane. Thank you. Yeah, I also want to thank you, uh, thanks Xiang for guiding us on this uh, community growth plan. And uh, of course, thank you, Alex Liz and Alex and uh, helping us to get this in. And uh, it's been a long journey, but it's definitely we'll see what we are lacking off and uh, what we can improve. And I definitely believe Longhorn will be great sandbox project. And uh, yeah, let's see when will we become incubator and even graduate. We have a higher goal now. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, what's next? Is it Jaeger? Jaeger. Yuri, hi. Hello. All right, thank you. Um, so, uh, Jaeger is just as a brief introduction. Uh, um, so, as a brief introduction, uh, Jaeger project uh, has several different parts. Um, and uh, so, I have a kind of a diagram here. On the left, we have uh, uh, what uh, seven official repositories with implementing uh, Jaeger clients uh, implementing open tracing API. Those are the SDKs that you put in your application for collecting uh, tracing telemetry. Uh, then we have the main repository, which is a Jaeger backend. Uh, it also has another repository with the visualization front end. Uh, and we have uh, uh, several other repositories that uh, implement various data mining tools uh, like aggregations, dependency diagrams, and all of that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, as an overview of the project, uh, the development started at Uber in August 2015, and then in April we open sourced it. Uh, uh, Red Hat came on board at that time and started actively participating in development. Uh, and so they actually the ones to encourage us to apply to CNCF, which we did, and we were incubating since September 2017. Uh, I think we missed our annual year last year for some reason we didn't do that. Um, uh, so uh, one thing that, uh, so we have a, a number of uh, users using Jaeger in production. Uh, there's a, a doctor's file in the repository, although it's not super uh, up to date. There are many more users than what's listed there. We recently published a number of case studies uh, after interviewing some of these companies, specifically Master Grafana and WeWork, so they're positive about how those companies are using. And obviously Uber is uh, uh, probably one of the largest users um, of Jaeger in production. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, so this one, uh, Matt Klein, who is a sponsor for graduation, asked me to put a couple of slides uh, talking about Jaeger versus open tracing and open telemetry, which are other tracing projects in, in CNCF. So uh, here, first, uh, uh, the Jaeger versus open tracing, which is a current state. Uh, as we can see in the diagram, so if you have a user application process, uh, it can be actually instrumented in some different ways. You can directly instrument your code, or you can use some framework uh, like gRPC, which comes with a trace instrumentation, or sometimes you use an automatic agent, which will do monkey patching or some other type of automatic instrumentation. Uh, but all of those types of instrumentation, they ultimately talk to the open tracing API. Uh, and so there, therefore, instrumentations are portable. You can, you can take any other vendor as a tracing. And then what Jaeger does is that the blue, starting from the blue line, it implements the open tracing API. So all the calls from the instrumentation come to our library, and then we collect data and, and ship it out to Jaeger backend components. Um, the uh, Jaeger itself, uh, as, as a result, does not provide Jaeger project, does not provide any instrumentation whatsoever. So like if you want to use uh, gRPC with tracing, you would go to open tracing contrib. Uh, organization and you pull some library which actually implements that. Um, so that's part of uh, open tracing project. And again, that's the instrumentation is portable. Um, so next slide, please. So, um, and now like uh, the question about what about open tracing sensors, open sensors and telemetry. So open tracing and open sensors are merging into open telemetry as the sort of the next major version. Uh, and 
that that project has a bit more overlap with Jaeger, but uh, it's still a very synergistic overlap. And so, uh, as we can see here, OpenTelemetry also provides an API for instrumentation, uh, and it will provide in the future the actual instrumentation code. And so, that part doesn't really change that much from the uh, from the open tracing uh, state of the world. Uh, however, open telemetry will also come with the actual SDKs, uh, the implementation libraries running in your application that will collect the data. And so that will compete with the Jaeger client libraries that we have today in multiple languages. Uh, and uh, we as a project uh, uh, kind of leaders are actually very happy to discope that work from the Jaeger project because it was a lot of work and there's not something that that much unique in the Jaeger client libraries almost. So if OpenTelemetry can provide those libraries, uh, we would focus our effort instead on the backend and visualization and data mining, uh, which is the, really the meat of the project today. Um, and uh, the the last part is uh, OpenSensus uh, and OpenTelemetry by extension had another uh, two components called agent and collector. And the reason they did that is, uh, I think one of the challenges with open tracing was that if you are shipping the binary, uh, then you, as the author of the binary, you kind of have to make a choice which tracing implementation you bound with that library, unless you provide some flexible plugin framework as you can do in Java, but in like in the global binary, you can't do that. And so that was always a friction because people didn't know what to choose, which tracing library to choose. And so with open telemetry, you can choose the default implementation of open telemetry uh, and it so that you don't have to configure it. It will also export data in the default standard format. And therefore, agent and collector, which are simply components which accept that data and forward to the backend, whether it's tracing or Prometheus backend, uh, those, uh, those components can also be implemented as a standard component in open telemetry. So again, in the current state, we, we have a duplication of open telemetry, but in the future, if those components develop parity with Jaeger, then we'll be happy to switch to them and not uh, spend cycles on these two components. And again, our main focus will be at the bottom box, which is like a tracing backend, storage backend, uh, visualization, and data mining platform. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is, uh, as far as the graduation, uh, these are some of the stats about the project. Um, we uh, have over a thousand contributors, which uh, I think uh, since you have counts them like as authors of commits and pull requests and comments and issues. Uh, specifically of commits and pull requests, we have over, over like almost 400 uh, authors. Uh, and across different repositories, we have uh, currently, I think, 15 maintainers uh, with official commit rights. Um, and for the backend repository, it's uh, it's seven maintainers uh, from Uber and Red Hat, um, and some other stats uh, are also on the screen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for the graduation criteria, so uh, we have a pull request for for the proposal, which has a bit more details than than these slides. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a successful production user documented. Um, we, uh, Red Hat actually bundles Jaeger as part of their series mesh product. Uh, uh, and so they support it on, on that front as well as, as actual commercial product. Um, we, um, as I mentioned already, we have a pretty, pretty healthy community, although I would have liked uh, to be, uh, to have a few more maintainers. We, we have a couple more people who are currently actively contributing to the backend and they might become uh, full committers if they meet uh, the requirements that we have in the guidelines. Um, and uh, finally, in terms of like velocity, we, we do releases of the backend uh, approximately every two months. Uh, client libraries release on different cadence uh, as, as features are added and, uh, and needed. Um, and uh, yes, on the, in the backend, at least, uh, we had over 1,000 PRs merged last year. So uh, I think it's a project has a pretty good velocity. I think this is my last slide, last slide so i uh, happy, happy to answer any questions. I, my recollection is that Matt Klein is working on uh, the due diligence document right now. I think Matt isn't on the call today. Yeah, he couldn't make it. Yes, we, uh, he, we, yeah, he and I will be working on that document. It's, I think, um, I looked at the template, it's a bit more questions than what's in the TOC graduation. So, yeah, that will be forthcoming.
and I think obviously subject to the, the due diligence, uh, it, it does look like you're in very good shape from, from what I've seen there. Anyone got any comments or observations or questions? So I have a question on the process. Once the due diligence document is available, uh, what is the next step? Really, it's a vote from the TOC. Um, I'm sure if we have questions that come out of the due diligence or, or following on from this presentation, we might come back and ask questions. But uh, really, once we have the due diligence document, we can just take it to a vote. OK, sounds good. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I think the fact there's no questions probably means people are feeling pretty comfortable with what you've shown. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. What else do we have? Open policy agent security assessments. Sarah, is this you? Oh. Hello. Um, Ash is going to kick it off. Um, doing the um, left side, which is really about what OPA is, and then I'll follow up with the recommendations. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Ash Narkar. I am a software engineer at Styra and I'm a core contributor to the Open Policy Agent project. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. So let's talk about OPA. So the goal of the project uh, is to provide a consistent policy enforcement across the stack. And about OPA itself, it's a general purpose policy engine that can be used to enforce custom security policies in disparate systems using a high level declarative language called as Rego. And some of the benefits of OPA, if you think about it, a single organization can have like thousands of security components that require authorization. Each domain vendor and product uh, has its own authorization paradigm, expressiveness and interface for administrators to control authorization policies. So the challenge with achieving a least privileged authorization is the number, the complexity, dynamicity, and the heterogeneity of software systems that organizations are embracing. And so OPA provides this unified approach to authorization, giving organizations context-aware visibility and control over their authorization posture in dynamic environments. Uh, using mechanisms such as admission control, OPA provides guardrails so that organizations can impart enough power to their employees to promote rapid innovation without uh, compromising on security and safety. Regarding OPA's maturity, uh, Netflix is one of the earliest adopters of OPA, and they are using OPA for authorization of the HTTP and GRPC APIs. Companies like Chef use OPA for API authorization and auditing API access, and there are more than 20 companies who are actively using OPA in production for use cases such as ABAC, RBAC, admission control, risk management, and so on. Uh, regarding OPA's community, uh, we have around 78 contributors on GitHub right now. Uh, the project has been started more than 2,500 times, and we have a healthy Slack community of around 1,200 people. OPA, is also, uh, OPA has integrations available with more than 20 open source projects, such as Kubernetes, Docker, Terraform, Envoy, Istio, and we keep on adding more integrations. So that's pretty much on the OPA uh, overview side. Uh, Sarah, I hand it over to you. So yeah, I also want to point out on the bottom left is a link to the full security assessment, which includes a self-assessment of the project, which we are on the security review team um, chimed in on and um, worked on clarifications and contributed to the security analysis. And it's still in um, uh, PR, so we welcome people um, on the call or anybody um, to uh, review in detail and um, give us feedback. So um, coming to the recommendations, highlighting part of the security assessment is um, in OPA taking these heterogeneous environments that are so common in cloud and unifying policy um, then presents its own security risk. So part of the risk of the project is really twofold. One, that it's not implemented correctly, so you could have a false sense of security in um, thinking you have all these policy controls that you don't have, and um, in 
whether you've actually expressed the policy you intended to express. So, um, so it's important that people adopting these security measures don't consider it to be a panacea. You also have to be attentive to whether they have correct implementation and whether your design is implemented and expressed appropriately. So the recommendations um, for our um, security assessments really fall into two buckets. One is what could CNCF, what could we all do to improve security of the ecosystem in helping this project? Really things that are maybe outside of the scope that the project itself could really execute on effectively. So um, one idea is that a study of the user practices, if we were to discover um, CNCF members or um, companies that have implemented OPA, that would be a great resource for finding what are the things that, you know, people might have inadvertently deployed something incorrectly. Are there common patterns there? Are there also common patterns in insecurities? This OPA allows custom policies, therefore, Every policy is different, right? However, we all believe that there are actually common policies. OPA has like a rich set of examples. Maybe we could expand that by discovering what are emerging commonalities across its users. And that's where CNCF has visibility into a wide spectrum of users and could help this project. Um, another analogous um, recommendation is that um, it may be that individual companies applying OPA all have common dependencies, where if OPA were to integrate with a common dependency, maybe that would accelerate adoption of OPA, as well as adding security by creating um, robust um, implementations of integrations that are used by, um, but which would then be used by many vendors. So, so that's one part of the event recommendations. The other part of for the project itself, um, OPA has really vast documentation that is, is generally very good. Um, we felt that the attention to the gotchas, to the potential problems could have more attention in the documentation. And we also brainstormed some ways that OPA could be, could help be a little more secure by default. Like we had some ideas about how the implementation of the language or the tooling features could help that. And the easiest things were things that, um, or the most straightforward things I should say, um, are already on the roadmap in terms of improving testing and playground, you know, so that people can validate their policies. Um, but we also had some ideas about some changes to the language itself. And then um, also kind of a call to action for people who are using OPA. Um, we'd like to see uh, more companies represented on the security team. So if you're a company that's using OPA, um, maybe you could consider having one of your security experts join the group. So um, I, we, there's also a link to the security assessment overview and I'd like to invite questions, discussion. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Actually, one little question. Is Rego used for anything else or is it purely used for OPA? So Rego is OPA's high level declarative language. So it's like at the core of OPA. So it's uh, for OPA itself. Mm -hmm. So it's, okay. custom, it's made for OPA. Yeah. So yeah, one of the things what? that I had learned about OPA ages ago and um, it kind of has some heritage in like Zachmel and there, there are predecessors that influenced its design. So there's, yeah, there I, seems I was to gonna, be... I was going to say Go the same thing. It's, there's a long history of use of similar types of tooling in security use cases, but not in cloud native ones. So just to add to that, it's it's inspired by data log, uh, just to give some some history on Rego. Uh, just a comment, I don't I don't think that assessment link exists, or I, I can't find that document. Is it? Hmm. Uh, oh, because the PR is not merged. Maybe. Oh, it was supposed to link to the. Um, I will stick it in the chat. Oh, that so is, uh, so if you read the text, it's not linked. The te that's where it will be. Um, I just put in the chat the link to the commit that, so that you can read it ahead of time. 
Okay. And then we can look at it here. I suppose the, the follow on question is to uh, is really for Ash, you know, how the open project feels about the assessment process, whether those are useful recommendations, um, you know, whether the project is planning to, to follow up on those recommendations, that would be useful feedback. Yeah, sure. So it's been really helpful to work with the assessment uh, process. So uh, we've identified certain issues through this entire process and we've opened up uh, issues for this, which we will definitely uh, tackle because we want to be as secure and uh, user friendly as possible. Some of these are valid concerns about users uh, not being sure about what the policies they're authoring because the policy language itself is so strong. So adding more documentation and whatever checks that we can put to reduce user errors is definitely helpful, which came across to this process. So uh, yeah, I would say it was very helpful for the project itself. And uh, we hope to tackle these issues in the near future. That's really good to hear. Good to hear that the, you know, the assessments are bearing fruit. So uh, thank you everyone who was involved in putting that assessment together. That's great. Any other questions from Amy? Yeah, I had a quick one. Sorry, I was just looking at the PR. Um, it's it's called a self-assessment. It's not entirely clear. So did the project assess, assess itself or did the security SIG assess the project? I was just... Both well, of them. And so the there's two parts to it in the assessment process. One is that the project goes through and is asked to kind of answer and fill out a bunch of information. And then afterwards, the group that does a security assessment effectively also writes a document. And there's a couple of reasons why we have this structure set up. One of which is that um, the, the project may feel that they've made a step that their documentation on a certain item is an adequate way to address something or that some security concern isn't under their purview. Um, whereas the a group that does the assessment can in their other document sort of be able to have a a different perspective on items. Um, in this case, we didn't really find a strong need for the two to diverge greatly, but I think there were quite a few places where we stressed things differently. So it's helpful to have um, the documents uh, so that the different perspectives can come through. Okay, thanks. So, so it's actually done independently by the project and by SIG security, it sounds like. Yeah, we, we do talk with each other um, a lot, obviously, throughout this process and interact with each other and make suggestions to the other document. But they have ownership of their self-assessment. We have ownership of the, uh, like the summary assessment that, that the uh, assessment group did. This is actually quite nicely documented. The security assessments guide lays out the steps. I think that's quite nicely presented. Yeah, and I think that I'm also say, finding that um, the the commonality in the breakdown of the sections helps um, quickly scan these documents. And so it's my hope that having the same format for many projects will help people look across projects and pick the one that is appropriate for their use case and their risk profile. Okay. I guess one other follow-up action we could take here is to um, uh, loop in Cheryl and the user community um, and see whether there's interest in, in getting some more case study information together for this kind of uh, the CNCF recommendation side of things. So yeah, I had an initial meeting with her um, a couple of weeks ago and she's very interested in they, 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 they don't isn't currently a structure for how we would do that kind of outreach. Uh, but she's very interested in um, trying to figure out what would be the way that we could do this kind of um, user research. And um, Amy and I are trying to figure out the right, you know, kind of set of um, folks who could execute on it. I mean, I think it would be um, an effort from SIG security, but we tend to have security experts rather than, you know, the people who um, really know how to frame that type of research project. So. We're still kind of feeling our way through how we would execute on it, but um, but I'm really excited about the opportunity of, of reaching out to that end user community. All right, so we're bang on the hour. Thank you everyone who has presented today. Perfect timing and uh, 
to you all again soon, I'm sure. Yes, we'll be putting together next uh, meetings calls together. We are prioritizing our graduation reviews. So ping me if you are a project that would like to be able to have your graduation reviews entered. So thank you.